What's up guys? Now this isn't going to be a repair this evening, this is going to be something different. A friend of mine sent me his JBL 14001 which is one of my personal favourite car audio amplifiers, a very very nice piece of kit for repair. I looked at it on, on the bench and I found nothing wrong with it, it ran perfectly fine and benched good power. Because he, of his system, he was curious to see whether there was anything I could do to make this amplifier run more reliably at a lower impedance. Now, the 14001 is only stable down to two ohms uh, at factory. However, it, because it's built so well, it tends to work really quite well wired under two ohms, provided your system is efficient. This is for another video, I'll go into why you shouldn't ask the question, will this amp work at 0.5? It's nothing to do with the amp, it's to do with your system. However, if you run an amplifier under its recommended lowest impedance, and after impedance rise on some frequencies, you are actually, your reactive load is lower than the two ohms that this amplifier is designed for, then it's going to run really hot and it could cause damage eventually. But there are potentially some changes we can make to the amplifier to make it run more reliably at the lower impedance. Now, in order for me to be comfortable giving this back to a customer and saying, yes, I am happy for you to run this at one ohm, which would be half the uh, recommended impedance for this, or 1.33 ohms, I have to be very happy that the amplifier can do that power into a static load. That's the whole point of this. An amplifier that is rated for one ohm will never, never see one ohm or when installed into a system with a subwoofer because due to impedance rise. But to be called a one ohm amplifier, it has to be able to comfortably drive a static one ohm load that's a, a just dummy loads uh, for quite a long period of time without getting too hot and, and, and overheating. So obviously this amplifier being a, a two ohm amplifier isn't designed to run a one ohm or 1.33 ohm load for long periods of time because it will super overheat and will most likely get damaged. So we're going to see if there's anything we can do to make this happy running a one ohm static load. First of all, I want to show you how much power these things put out at their recommended two ohms. So we've got some dummy loads over here on the bench and uh, I've got my power supplies all hooked up ready to go with the oscilloscope. So we are going to run this on a static load, two ohms to clip point and we're going to calculate how much power it does. Okay, let's turn the power supplies on and drop the test. Now you may notice that on my scope I have both of my probes, channels one and two, activated. And that, my friends, is because this is a full bridge amplifier. Yes, the 14001 is a full bridge amplifier. I bet you only thought that Brazilians were full bridge amplifiers. Other examples of full bridges are Vibe Monobox 4, um, lots of Alpine, MRP and MRD amplifiers are full bridge. Um, there's literally loads of full bridge amplifiers out there that you didn't even realize. The JBL 1401 is a full bridge amplifier. So, as a result of that, we have two out of phase waves on plus output and minus output. So this is the positive speaker terminal, and this is the negative speaker terminal, and there is an out of phase wave on those to give you double the resulting voltage of each wave. So, let's continue turning this up until we reach clip point. Okay, there we go, it was there, so I might try and zoom in a little bit on my scope, go down to 10 volt divide and see if we can get a little clearer picture of the clip point there. Okay, let's go down a touch, a little bit too much clip. You can actually hear the amplifier start to buzz as it clips. So you can actually use that as a clip detection factor if you like. If you don't have a clip LED and you can't afford a SMD DD1, just put your ear up against the amplifier and listen for that buzzing sound when it clips. So that's, that's pretty clean. Let's go up one more click just to the clip point there. That's where it starts clipping. So I'm going to take that as a very, very clean output wave. Okay, cool. And the voltage drop on my multimeter here, uh, that was down to 12 volts exactly. So these power supplies are 12 volt supplies. So here we can calculate how much power that did at 12 volts and then use square law correction factor for 14.4 volts. And holy fucking shit guys! 
Yes, these amplifiers are absolutely awesome. 1,918 watts RMS at 2 ohms, 14.4 volts. That's why I freaking love these things. That is horrifically overrated power and super clean as well. Look at this sine wave. Usually, like, I mean, okay, so that would probably be like around uh, 0.5 or 1% THD. You've got a little bit on here of the top and bottom wave there, just starting to touch the top of the rail, but it's not actually gone to a square. It's not actually gone to a, a square line yet. So that is very clean power. You could, in a vehicle, you could run that a tiny bit more into soft clip and present no danger to the amplifier or the subwoofer, running it a little bit higher into clip there, and you could probably squeeze over just over 2K out of this amplifier as standard. Standard stock 14001, 1900 watts and more at a very clean sine wave. Fucking wicked. However, this is not about a 2 ohm load. This video is about running lower than 2 ohms. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to change the dummy loads to present a 1.33 ohm load to the amplifier and we're going to see how much power it does at 1.33 ohms completely factory. Now you might be thinking, hmm, when the hell would you use 1.33 ohms? Well, you might use it if you're running three dual 2 ohm subwoofers or if you're running three single 4 ohm subwoofers in parallel. Uh, are, and, and also JBL, they, I think they did some subwoofers that were dual 1.5 ohm coils and so you could wire to 1.5 ohms, so this gives you a better idea how much power it would do at 1.5 ohms. Um, and JL Audio also did some 3 ohm subwoofer coil subwoofers. Um, so yes, I'm going to wire this down to 1.33 ohms now and give you a good idea as to just how much power this thing can do factory at 1.33. Okay, so let's clear off the uh, scope screen here and uh, ready for our 1.33 ohm bench test. And actually, just to confirm and prove to you guys that this is a static 1.33 ohm uh, we've got on the amplifier, the test lead resistance of my multimeter is 0.4 of an ohm. So if we check the terminals of the amplifier, we have 1.7 minus 4 is 1.3. So we have 1.3 or 1.33 recurring ohms on the terminals of the amplifier. And in order to obtain that load, I just have three 4 ohm dummy loads in parallel, giving us the 1.33. Okay, and just reset the gain position because it will be different now. We're at a lower impedance. So let's start the amplifier up again and drop the bench test. So slowly from the bottom once more. Okay, there was clip point there, so let's go back a little bit. Back her off just a touch. Okay, and up a little bit more, just a touch more. There we go, that's our clip point, so let's pause it on there. Okay, there we go. So as you can see, it's a bit lower now. We're down at 21.74 volts. And what was the voltage drop on the multimeter? during that test. Let's see. Let's do it one more time, 11.98. 11.97, so not too bad. So it's still not drawing horrific amounts of current at 1.33 ohms. And I can already tell you, this is gonna be a seriously nice amount of power that this is, is doing at 1.33. You're gonna be super blown away by this. And I know this is only like a short pulse of 1.33, but it's proving the amplifier is capable of doing that while still producing a relatively clean looking, well, a very clean looking sine wave. And if you were wiring your speakers up at 1.33, again, due to impedance rise, it would never see what it's seeing now. So you should be very happy. Um, so yes, let's see. Equals a touch more power. It's about 100 watts more power. So that's 2057 watts RMS. Uh, point 13. So we're already doing over 2000 watts and I might say with a very decent looking sine wave Usually when you wire an amplifier down below its rated impedance even on a burst test like this It ends up looking really really crappy on the sine wave, but it still looks very respectable That would still play absolutely fine on the subwoofer now here comes the hard part one 
ohm static load on a factory 14001. What's it going to do? Is it going to blow up? Is it going to do some power? Will it do more power than it just did or will it do less? It might do less power because the current draw is too much and it can't cope with it. So let's wire up our dummy loads to 1 ohm now and do the very scary 1 ohm test that I'm not looking forward to doing. Okay, we're all wired up to 1 ohm and just to confirm on the multimeter we should have 1.4 because we have 0.4 of test lead resistance so this should show up at 1.4 yes it does so we have one ohm on the speaker terminals now let's plug this back in to read the voltage drop turn the gain back down to zero again and uh, reset the oscilloscope turn it on and let's see what happens So start with the gain right down to zero and just gonna make sure the amp is cool. Yeah, the heatsink is uh, still pretty cold. So it shouldn't, uh, now heat is a problem. Heat causes MOSFETs to not be able to put out as much current. So, okay, let's slowly turn it up and see what happens here. Okay, so it looks like the amp's gone into protection there. So we, uh, the, the, we lost one of the, um, we lost one of those uh, those rails there, one of the outputs, and I believe that that has got that went into protection. So, what the amplifier has is it has overcurrent um, resistors on the output section. So it has great big bar. I'll show you these in a minute. It has great big bar resistors, and it measures the voltage drop across the great big resistors. And if the voltage drop across those is greater than a certain uh, amount then it triggers the protection circuit, which is what just happened there. So the amplifier doesn't do a 1 ohm static load at the moment. It will only do a 1.33 to clip point. So let's take the amplifier apart just now and let's see what we can do to make it happy down at 1 ohm static. All right, here we are. So after an amplifier has gone into protection, especially when you're doing stupid shit like that on the output section, it's a good idea before you power it up again to just make sure that you didn't short out any of the output FETs. Because if you did and you try and power the board on again, what happens is because there's a short circuit over here on the output section, the power supply, the, the protection is delayed by like a fraction of a second. And when you try and turn the amp on, the power supply is going to try and power the short circuit and blow the power supply as well. Uh, so let's just confirm that we don't have a short on the output section following that protection there. So we've got uh, good looking MOSFETs on this bank here. Yeah, that looks good. So we don't have any shorts between the gate and the source. Okay, cool. So as proven there, the amplifier just protected due to overcurrent on the output section. So overcurrent uh, detection is actually done, like I said, by these great big bar resistors. And these are these things here. So what these resistors will be is these will be across the rail voltages. So the power supply generates plus minus rail voltage and that then gets fed to the MOSFETs. But before it goes to the MOSFETs, it is fed through these bars and these are essentially a very very low value resistor and the circuit knows the exact resistance of these bars and because it, it is by, by all intents and purposes a resistor there will be a very tiny amount of voltage drop across these bars and the circuit is measuring the voltage drop across these bars and if the voltage drop goes above a certain number like a fraction of a volt 0.01 or something or it'll be calibrated to a very 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 um, accurate number um, then it will trigger the protection because it knows that there is excessive current flowing across these bars so in order for us to run this down at one ohm there are two options that we can do we can either recalibrate the protection circuit we can add some um, mass to these resistors to give them an even lower resistance to cause the protection circuit to trip later or we can just jump over them and disable the overcurrent protection entirely. I am more tempted to just disable the overcurrent protection entirely because most of the time it doesn't actually save anything anyway and these amplifiers are so robust that it's very unlikely that it's going to die. If it does die due to the overcurrent protection not being present then all it will do is it will just take out eight 3205 MOSFETs which are pretty cheap and I've got hundreds of anyway. So 
it's not really going to do it any any good. This this thing would only really trip if there is a, a short on the output section anyway. So if there's going to be a short on the output section, um, then it means it needs to come in for a repair anyway. So all it means is it means I've got to replace eight thirty two oh fives instead of just um, the output vets, which is no big deal. That's fine. And this is obviously the customer's amplifier, so we will speak with the customer, just confirm everything that he's happy to go ahead with in getting this thing running super low impedance. So what are the things that we can actually do to this amplifier to make it better at a lower impedance? We have the output FETs here and we have the power supply FETs here. These are the things that are actually doing the power. They're taking the power from the car or from the rail voltages and they are applying the audio signal to the rail voltage. So these are the things that actually are kind of, they're passing the most power and they are responsible for sort of generating the audio from the rail voltage. So these are the things that first and foremost we want to upgrade if we want the amplifier to be able to do more power. So if we take a look first at the output FETs, let's have a look at what it's using. So the output FETs that it's using are IXTP 50N20. Now these are very easy to read these FETs because the name of the FET literally tells you the voltage and current rating. So 50 is the amount of current that this FET can handle. N means this is an N channel MOSFET and 200 means it's 200 volts. So this is a 200 volt N channel MOSFET capable of passing 50 amps continuously. Because we're using these FETs in a class D switching circuit, we're actually a bit more interested in a rating called pulse current drain. Um, that's a little bit more important in this and there's loads and loads of other factors on the data sheet that will um, tell you how good these FETs are for your specific application. I won't go into that today because that will be an hour long video by itself. So okay, so we need some FETs that are going to be better than these. Now what makes a FET better than another? Well obviously it's current rating is one thing, but not only its current rating. The reason that FETs get hot is because the FET has a resistance. When the FET is turned on, when the circuit tells the FET to turn on and pass the voltage through it, the FET has a resistance. And as you know, resistance creates heat. So the lower the resistance of the FET that you use, the less heat that it's going to generate whilst it's doing power. So we want to try and go for a super low resistance, high current MOSFET on the output, but that's still quick enough to deal with the switching frequency of this circuit. Now you can't always just go ahead and fit the highest power FET that you can find that fits in with these specifications because the higher the power of the FET, the harder it is for the circuit to drive. So if we take a look at this circuit here, we are presented with two driver boards. Now this is a full bridge amplifier, so we have one driver board um, per half amplifier. So if you think about this being a full bridge amplifier, we have the speaker terminals, we have plus, minus, plus, minus, but in this case, plus and minus both have audio on them. So we have the plus speaker terminal amplifier is maybe this one, and the minus speaker terminal amplifier is this one. So we essentially have two amplifiers almost like a two channel amplifier working in bridge mode. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way of thinking about it. And these are the two drive circuits for each half of the bridge. If we take a look at the drive circuit, this is actually the drive IC chip. So this chip here, which is an IR2010S, this is responsible for driving the gates of the MOSFETs, and the MOSFET gate is pin number one. Now pin number one, the gate, the higher the power and the lower the RDS, the on resistance, the FET, then generally the higher input capacitance this gate leg has. So the FET, actually the gate, acts like a capacitor. And on this leg you will see a massive great big uh, square wave or a small square wave riding along the, uh, the low um, riding along the low rail voltage. And because there's a square wave, a very 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 fast square wave on this leg, if this leg has its own capacitance then it will cause a massive disruption in the drive wave. It will ring back and there will be res residual voltage and residual current on the leg or on the gate and it will cause problems to the drive and make it much harder for the drive IC to deal with. Now fortunately, because this amplifier is using IR2010S chips, these are incredibly powerful and great at driving very powerful MOSFETs. These are in fact the same drive ICs that Banda uses in the Banda Viking 8000, which is a 10k at 14 
volt amplifier and uses some very very big MOSFETs on the output section very hard to drive as does the the tower amps actually also uses this chip and a few other amplifiers this is a very good chip for driving powerful MOSFETs so fortunately because JBL have included this chip in this amplifier we can pretty much throw whatever FETs we like on this and it should be able to drive them quite well now if we upgrade the output section FETs there are other things that we will need to check out and do as well it will help to thicken up the traces on this amplifier board. So on the back of the circuit board, there are obviously these traces that will pass the power from the transformers to the rail caps and then to the FETs. So with excessive current or additional current, we want to try and thicken these traces up to minimize the voltage drop across the traces to get them to the FETs with minimal voltage drop. The rail voltages that feed the FETs come from these transformers, which are the power supply transformers. They turn uh, the 12 volts from your car into the plus and minus rail voltages that the amplifier needs. Now, these are the power supply MOSFETs down here. These will need to be upgraded as well. In fact, these are probably more important than the output FETs to get upgraded because these ones are the things that take more of a hit when you run a low impedance and they get much hotter. Now the uh, JBL14001 uses pretty okay, pretty decent FETs as standard. It uses the IRF3205, which is pretty standard across the board. And it's the FET that I recommend people use when they are replacing other power supply MOSFETs in other amplifiers, 70N60, for example. This is a good replacement for that. And all sorts of other things. 3205, very reliable, decent, solid power supply MOSFET. However, in this amplifier, in this case, because we're going to be running something so crazy, we need something better than that. The power supply FETs are driven by a couple of discrete transistors here. We have an NPN and a PNP. Now this is going to be slightly harder because these are not that great. They're not the best of transistors that we could use to drive these MOSFETs very powerfully. Now obviously the path of current doesn't finish there. Um, it obviously goes through the transformers and it also goes through the inductor on the output section to filter out the um, switching frequencies. However, I have looked at this and I have compared the resistance of these transformers and the inductor to other amplifiers which are actually claiming to do over 3000 watts RMS at one ohm and they are very similar. So Dave, JBL has actually used some very solid components here which are well above what the amplifier needs in order to do its rated power at 1400 watts RMS, even 1900 watts RMS. These components here, the transformer and inductor, are actually pretty pretty safe and pretty happy up to around 3k or so. So yeah, I think we can leave these in. We haven't got to do anything to the transformers or inductors to make this thing do more power. The only other thing that the power transfers through are the rectifier diodes. These are the things that change the alternating wave that comes out of the transformers into the plus and minus rail voltages. I've looked at the models of these and these are actually well within specification to do what we want for a 1 ohm load. For the, so for the time being, I'm going to leave these as stock. So in order to get this running at 1 ohm, I should really only need to change the FETs on the output section, the FETs on the power supply section, thicken up the traces on the circuit board and also bridge over the current sensing resistors here in the center of the board to prevent the protection circuit triggering when it detects higher current than it's designed for originally. There we are, board is out of the heat sink. Now the parts that I have selected to install in this amplifier as an upgrade, we have the power supply FETs, which I have chosen to go for IRFB3004 PBF. These are a significant upgrade over the 3205s, but still relatively easy to drive. And for the output section, I have chosen to go for FDP61N20, which are only a touch higher than the 50N20s. However, they have a considerably lower RDS, so that should make them run quite a bit cooler than, we, than these ones do. Okay, cool. Let's get to removing these original FETs and installing the new ones and then we can turn the amplifier on and see how it likes the new ones. And we can also see here, these are the bars which are the current sensing resistors. So what we'll do is on the back of the board, we'll just jump over with a thick piece of copper wire over these bars. So to remove these, I'm just gonna cook up all three legs at the same time. And they just fall out super nice and easy. You don't want to pull hard at all. The FET will literally just fall out when it's ready. Don't tug on it because you'll pull the veers out and uh, that's not going to be a fun day. It will literally just drop out super easy of its own accord once the solder is hot enough. 
One thing that I did forget to mention is that on the power supply, we are probably going to have to change these resistors. Now these resistors are right by the FET and they are along the gate line. So these are in between the drive transistor and the MOSFET gate. And these prevent ringing and they clean up the wave and they sort out some issues with the gate capacitance as well. Now because the 3205s have pretty low gate charge and pretty low input capacitance, the resistor value here is quite high. It's 101, which means 100 ohms because you have one zero, meaning 10, and then the last one is the number of zeros. So one zero and one zero is 100 ohms. Now 3205s are usually ran between 47 ohm gate resistors and 100 ohm gate resistors. This is the highest that I've generally seen on a 3205. Because we have much better MOSFETs that we're putting in, which have a much higher input capacitance than the originals and a higher gate charge, we are going to have to change those gate resistors to a lower value to allow more of the gate charge through and to prevent the ringing along the 100 ohm resistor. But what I might be tempted to do is actually just fit these FETs without changing the gate resistors first to show you what I mean when the gate resistor value is too high because I'm pretty sure this is going to be too high and I don't think they're going to like it. And uh, just to give you guys an idea as to what happens and what it looks like when the MOSFET doesn't like the gate resistor value that's being used. I just wanted to show you the values in person here between the FET. So here we have one of the original 3205s from the amplifier in the transistor tester and we're just going to run a test and see what the specifications come up here as. So the RDS, which is the resistance drain source when the FET is turned on, we can kind of ignore because it's so low that the uh, test lead resistance on the tester is greater, much greater than we're able to read here. So 0.2 of an ohm, it's much less than that on the FET, but it can't really read it due to the resistance of all this mechanism here. So the gate capacitance CG is 5.63. So this is the capacitance on the gate of these and the VT is the turn on voltage of the gate. So once the gate voltage reaches a certain threshold it will turn the FET on and in this case it's 3.4. So the main thing that we're going to be comparing here is the gate capacitance of the new FET which is an IRFB3004. And as you can see here, the gate capacitance is much, much higher. We're still turning on at 3.4. Nice to see it's the same actually as the originals, but the gate capacitance is way higher, which means that this FET is going to have a much lower RDS and a much higher um, current capability. Okay, so the new power supply FETs are fitted just on their own and I have deliberately left the output FETs out for this point in time because I want to check the power supply FETs first and I want to see how well they're driven by the drive circuit and whether they get warm at all on idle. The indication that these FETs are very happy on this drive circuit and in this circuit are that they stay absolutely stone cold on idle with the amplifier not running anything. So with the output FETs removed, there will be no current drawn from the amplifier at all. So these power supply FETs should not heat up at all. If they do heat up a little bit, then we will have to change the gate resistor value to a lower value to allow them to be driven better and faster so that they don't heat up. So let's turn the thing on and let's see how well they run. So we're gonna take our oscilloscope probe here and we're gonna be probing the output of the FET which is the drain and we're also going to be probing the gate to see how well the gate is being driven. I'm going to only allow like two amps to pass at this point and we're going to run on 10.6 volts to start with nice and safe. So let's go ahead and turn her on and see what happens. Here we go leaving it on for a little bit and I'm going to turn it off and uh, yeah these FETs are starting to run pretty damn hot. So if we take our thermal imaging camera I can actually show you that. Okay, if we look down our thermal imaging camera, I don't know how well this stupid head cam is going to make this out because the contrast and the focus is very, very bad. But the power supply MOSFETs are actually running at like 32 degrees after a few seconds of operation, which is much less than ideal. They're not running stone cold like the originals were. So we can take a look at the drive wave and we can see why it is that they're running a hot like that. So I'm going to probe the gate of the power supply MOSFETs now and I'm going to show you what this looks like on the scope screen. Ooh, nasty, nasty, nasty. That is not looking very good at all. They're not being turned off properly. They're being tur they're not turning off quick enough and they're not turning on quick enough either because there's a massive great big resistor in the way of the gate. 
So in order to solve that, I'm going to go ahead and take some much lower value gate resistors to load up in here. They're originally 100 ohms. I'm going to put some 22 ohm or there or thereabouts. I'm going to see what I've got in here. I want something between 20 and 25 ohms if possible. Uh, if that's no good, then I'll go down to 10 ohms. If that's no good, then I'll go down to 3.3 ohms. That's going to put some pretty heavy stress on our little driver transistors. Okay, in my box of requirements here, I have some 22R1, which are 22.1 ohm resistors. These will do just fine. So let's go ahead and pull out those 100 ohms and let's fit the 22.1 ohms in place. And to do that, we're going to need to use our um, hot air soldering station here with the heat gun and some tweezers in order to remove those SMD resistors. Here we go, there's one. There we are, so the resistors are removed and I'm just gonna freshen up the solder pads for these uh, and I, I'm too lazy, I couldn't be bothered to change over my soldering iron tip so I'm gonna use the big, the big tip for this, which is fine, it's cool, we're accurate enough with this. Cool, and now let's install our 22.1s. There we go, there's one. Okay, that's all of our new resistors in, so let's go ahead and see whether that makes a difference to how these FETs run. Now, I've just been using the hot air gun to solder, so um, these area is very hot, so to cool it down quicker, I'm going to take some isopropyl alcohol spray, because it evaporates very quickly, spray the back of the FETs, and then give them a blow, and they should cool down very quickly, because... Uh, Okay, they're pretty cool now, so let's go ahead and see the drive wave. Has it made a difference installing lower value gate resistors? I imagine it probably has. Let's take a look. Oh yeah, uh, that's what I'm talking about. That is a much, much happier drive wave. So what I do want to check though for sure is that these FETs run cold as a result of much better drives. So they are still a teeniest bit warm from our soldering, especially this one. So let's just wait for them to cool down a little bit more. Okay, turn the amplifier off and let's check for heat on the FETs, see if they're running cold or not. Yeah, they're still absolutely stone cold. They're the same temperature as they were um, after I'd finished the soldering. So yeah, happy days. That has resolved our power supply with much better effects and it's very happy by the looks of things. And I'm also just going to check it at 13.6, actually no, fuck it, let's give it 14.4 volts and let's just double check, make sure, because at the higher voltage then any issues that are present as a result of bad drive, um, oh that is such a beautiful drive wave. That's better than some amplifiers that I see stock. Ah, oh, lovely. Considering these are such high gate capacitors, that's a really nice drive wave. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and wait for this, give it a few seconds of idle, uh, and see if the FETs do get warm whatsoever, even at 14.2 volts. Let's have a feel. No, they're stone cold. Super duper. Yeah, I'm fucking well happy with that. That is awesome. There's one other thing that I'm also going to do, which I forgot to mention earlier. You'll notice that this amplifier has fuses on board. Now, not all amplifiers have fuses on board, especially ones that are greater than 2000 watts RMS in power, because usually there's not enough room to fit the required fuse ratings on the actual board itself. Um, so what I'm going to do is because fuses and fuse blocks and fuse connections, they are all an additional source of resistance. Um, any contacts, and especially these fuses, they will have a fairly high resistance across so therefore you will get voltage drop across the fuse which is not ideal so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to bridge over the fuse traces here to eliminate the fuses from the board and give a solid connection from the power input here to the board to the power supply MOSFETs now obviously the amplifier will still be fused the same as any non-fused amplifier is on the board it's fused along the power wire as normal so having these onboard fuses really isn't required because so many amps don't have them anyway 
One thing which is a bit annoying is that the amplifier only comes with four gauge inputs as standard. Um, running this amplifier down at one ohm with the higher power, I would really love to have zero gauge, but to install zero gauge on here is not something that is worth, it's like you'd have to cut the, the plate and you'd have to fuck, it would be just a bit too much work. So an easier way to get around that is just to use zero gauge to four gauge reducers and there you go, you've got zero gauge into your 14 double Okay, that's the fuse jumped over. It's not the prettiest looking of things, but it is very solid. We've got the three wires going across from the fuse to here. We've thickened up this trace as well, coming straight in from here. Now, this amplifier actually has this inductor, which sits on the power wire before it gets to the power supply fets. And this is a nice touch from JBL. Most amplifiers don't include this. This is to prevent noise from coming back down the 12 volt line and therefore causing noise on other amplifiers in the system. Like, like you know, when you turn your bass amp on and sometimes you get a wee noise coming through the car speakers. This is to prevent that. I am in two minds whether to leave it connected or whether to jump over it because most amps don't have this and this is just another source of resistance but it does look pretty solid these are the wires that are actually going through so I mean there's a shit load of strands I mean this is pretty hefty um, I am tempted to leave it in for the time being uh, if when I'm doing some testing at 1 ohm and 1.33 ohms uh, for a long duration of time I'll use my thermal imaging camera and if I can see this getting hot on the thermal imager then I might be tempted to jump over it because obviously if it's getting hot then there's resistance which means there's voltage drop which means no good so I will monitor this but I want to leave it connected because it's a cool thing but I'm aware that it might be hindering our performance so now I want to turn my attention to the output feds. Now the output feds that we've got for this, they are an upgrade over the originals, but they're not as horrifically different as the originals like the power supply feds were. So these are 61 N20Ds. Uh, so these are uh, 11 amps per FET better in terms of DC current draw, but their pulse drain current and their characteristics at the voltage we're going to be running at are are much better suited. So the output section already uses pretty low gate resistors. We've got 10 ohm gate resistors here. So I don't think we'll need to change those. If we do, I've got some four R7s to go in, which will be a good replacement. So let's go ahead, suck the solder from these holes, fit these new FETs and see how it likes them. There we go. So output FETs are soldered in and let's wait for them to cool a tad. Use our alcohol spray once more to cool these down a bit quicker, get the uh, heat to evaporate through them nice and quick. Okay, so let's power her up and see how happy it is with these new output FETs. So my power supply on. Oops, let's turn it down from 14.4 just to start with. Starting on a, on a safer lower voltage of, uh, of around 9.6 is, is uh, let's go for, let's go for, let's go for about 10 point something. 10.6 is fine. Okay, so let's just first of all check that we haven't made any solder bridges here. Yep, looks good. And let's turn the scope up to see the full wave. Okay, 1.2 amps. And uh, yeah, the output wave looks okay. We've got a bit of a spike. Actually, that's not too bad. That's that's pretty normal. What does the drive wave look like? Let's zoom in on the low side drive wave just here. That looks pretty good. I don't think we're going to need to change our gate resistor. Let's uh, turn that off and let's check for heat on the FETs after that small bit of operation. Now, I don't want to just go and feel all of them um, because they have high voltage on them still, so I'll get a little shock. I just want to feel uh, two and two. Yeah, they're absolutely stone cold, so that's pretty good. Let's check 14.4. Nice, looks good. The drive wave looks pleasant as well. Okay, let's check for heat. Yeah, absolutely stone cold. Nice. Okay, fantastic. So we haven't actually got to do any more work to the amplifier uh, at all, apart from thicken up those traces and jump over the um, current sensing resistive bars. 
Alright, so I've thick thickened up some of the traces on the bottom of the board and um, I think she's ready to go back in the case and we can drop a bench test now and see how much difference this has made to the output. And we're going to test at 2 ohms again, see if it's made any difference. Then I'm going to test at 1.33 again, see if it's made any difference. Then I'm going to do the 1 ohm bench test and make sure that it can do the 1 ohm and see how much power it does down there. Alright, so the moment we've all been waiting for then, bench test time, we're going to start off with the 2 ohm load and see if it's made any difference at 2 ohms out of interest. So let's give you the scope screen and let's see, is there any difference to the power output at, 12, at 2 ohm? Okay, that's, we're going to stop it there, so that's pretty much right on clip point. And uh, I think we've got a slightly higher voltage there than we had earlier. We've got 28.05 and 27.52, but um, because we have differences in how the scope has been calibrated, because it's super old scope, um, these will be should be identical. So we're going to go ahead and take the 28.05. Um, so let's take 28.05 times by 2. Gives us 56.1 and 56.1 volts. No fucking way. No, 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 what the fuck? That is, that is absolutely insane. Well, the proof's there, guys. It's there on the screen. It's a bit more clipped than before, albeit it's, it's very difficult to get the game knob in the exact same position every time and get the exact same clip thing every time. But that is a lot of... Let, let's do it again, but let's let's run it a tiny bit cleaner, similar to how we had before, okay? Okay, that's kind of similar to how we had before, right? Maybe even a touch less. There we go, that's very similar to before. Alright, there we go, that's incredibly similar to before. So, actually, how much difference is that? That is, um... Then this is volts RMS, remember, this is not volts peak to peak, this is volts RMS, so we got 26.88. That's still an improvement over our score earlier. That's still an improvement over our score earlier, 2080 watts RMS. But guys, it just goes to show you, in that tiny, tiny little bit of extra gain where we start seeing the clip wave appear, that's how much extra power is going to your subwoofer just with that tiny little bit more um, on the gain knob and a tiny little bit of clip there. So wow, okay, so we've already made an improvement at 2 ohms. Now it gets interesting, 1.33 ohms, let's give that a go. Okay, now we have 1.33 ohms on the speaker terminal, so let's go ahead and clear off the scope and do the test once again. There we go, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much our clip point, similar to before, really. Um, so how much power is that at 1.33? Did we gain anything? I'm thinking this is kind of going to be pretty similar uh, to start with. Um, not massive gains here. Okay, yes, we have gains once again. So that's how much power this just did at 1.33 ohms. All right, so that's pretty cool. We're getting more, we're getting bigger. This is now a pretty decent power amplifier. So let's keep going and let's drop it down to one ohm and let's see if the thing survives and let's see how much power it makes. Okay, the ultimate finale then. What's it going to do at 1 ohm? Smoke, power, less power than before? Let's find out. Okay, so that's a little bit dirty. That's a little bit dirty. Uh, but I think maybe we'll take it. Alright, we'll go down one more. We'll go, we'll go down the tiniest little bit if we can. We'll go down the tiniest little bit. That was 21.61 volts. It's a little bit on the clippy clip side. Let's go down a tiny bit more. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I can get it. It's so sensitive on the gain knob here. Okay, one more. Nah, it's too clean now. Okay, now actually that's pretty much perfect. Okay, 
So depending on how much you want to clip the amplifier, in, and uh, this is this is also not proper clip. This is like soft clip. This is like this is very marginally clipping the amplifier. It's very usable um, in your in your vehicle. Now the amplifier is starting to get a little bit warmer on the. Uh, I think that's the power supply side. I think actually the power supply and yeah the output section side doesn't seem to be. I mean it's getting like lukewarm. It's maybe like I don't know 32 degrees uh, mildly, but this is a very very stressful environment. For this amplifier to be to be doing so it didn't protect we disabled the protection circuit it actually did very reasonable voltage like you know the voltage isn't dropping can that much um by dropping the impedance load like on a, on a normal amplifier when you test 4 ohm 2 ohm and 1 ohm the voltage does drop the voltage at the clip point does drop considerably from, I don't know, say like uh, on a regular amplifier, it's 40 volts is clip on, on uh, 4 ohm, and then down at 2 ohm, the clip happens at like maybe 36, and then at 1 ohm, the clip happens at like 32. That's how it generally goes because you're drawing more power from the amplifier, there's more voltage drop across the circuit board, across the rails. However, this is very respectable from 26 volts at 2 ohm down to 20 volts at 1 ohm. That's very respectable, especially for an amplifier that's never Ever designed to do this so let's see how much fucking power was that and once again this is relatively clean this is just on the brink of clipping you could push it further and get more power if you wanted to 20.33 times 2 giving us 40.66 volts on there so let's put that in 40.66 volts at 1 ohm and ah shit I didn't check the voltage drop I need to check the voltage drop let me quickly do that 11.92 was the lowest I saw there, so we're going to take 11.92 as our voltage drop point. There we go guys, we have a total power that this amplifier is capable of doing at 1 ohm at 2412 watts RMS. So. I think that the limitations there in order to in order to get in this over two and a half K onwards to three K are going to be in the in the likes of that inductor which is on the power supply input, possibly the input terminals here being only four gauge. Uh, they're not heating up though. Like I say, things that have resistance get get hot. So let's whilst this is still whilst this has been quickly Whilst this has been recently running, let me very quickly undo all of these screws here for the power supply. Let's see if we can see what's got hot on the board, because that will be where the resistance is that's preventing this from doing any more power than it is. Okay, so yeah, that inductor that I was mentioning earlier, uh, that, is a that is actually quite warm. So there, there will be some voltage drop across that. Uh, the transformers, they will get warm because they're doing a, a, a fair job. Um, the inductor isn't that warm at all so the inductor is very uh, within its tolerance the transformers usually always get warm anyway it could probably do with some bigger ones if we're going to go for 3k it could do with some bigger better transformers possibly uh, it could do with a, re a, a rewind on this for thicker although it's not that hot um, other things that are hot I think the FETs that got the hottest were the power supply FETs so those are the ones which were getting the hottest. So if you if you did run this amplifier with 14 volts, it wouldn't get quite as hot as it was when I was just running it on 12 volts just there. Um, but yeah, apart from that, the hottest things were the power supply FETs just there. The output FETs were absolutely coasting along. They're, they haven't been getting warm at all, which is actually how we want it. Nice. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that, you know? The hottest things on here are the transformers. That's where the majority of our um, of our power is being lost in the transformers. But that's cool. I'm happy. The output fets are staying cold, so they're they're the, they're one of the most important parts for knowing whether this is stable at low impedance. When the customer is using this in his vehicle, he will not be seeing the same. This amplifier will not be seeing one ohm like it was here. It will be seeing far greater than one ohm. Um, maybe as Maybe the lowest it will see is 1.3, 1.5 if he's got a, a less efficient system. But uh, no, I'm fucking really happy with that. That's epic results uh, considering we haven't really done much. All we did was change the FETs and added some thickness to the traces, jumped over the fuse and jumped over the, uh, the overcurrent protection circuit. So pretty cool all in all. Uh, I think it's pretty epic to have a JBL 14001 which claims to be rated at 1400 watts RMS doing 2000 watts at 2 ohm that's like 
600 watts RMS overrated. That is the most underrated amp I've ever seen in my life. Um, and then goes on to do 2,400 watts and above at one ohm after some small modifications. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, click the subscribe button. If you want to be notified when I'm next doing a live stream, click the bell so you get a notification to your phone that tells you that I am live. Until next time, have a great day and stay basin.